and welcome to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers. I'm here with a very special guest who I really want to take the time to introduce you to, Rob Zins. Rob, great to have you here, brother. Thank you, Larry. Good to be here again yes. with you. Now, a lot of people don't really know who you are, although I know I've known you for decades. But uh, just to let our YouTube viewers out there get a good idea who you are, I'd like you to take some time and explain the books you have written. Now, you are a former Roman Catholic, yet you graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. Right. In fact, I think your, uh, your degree is in history. Historical truth. theology, right. Historical theology. So uh, with that said, and for the sake of our viewers who don't really know who you are, and there's going to be a lot of people like that, <laughs> I'd like you to kind of begin with some of the books you've written, some of the pamphlets, things that talk about your ministry, mm -hmm. maybe your website, and then I'll just throw in my two cents worth whenever I get a chance. Okay. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Larry. It's good to be here. Actually, after graduating from Dallas Seminary, it was my intention to go into the pastoral ministry and to become involved in local church work, which I think is probably what most of the uh, men who graduate from seminary want to do. But having been in the pastoral ministry for several years and, and having uh, come to some uh, idea through my studies about the great Protestant Reformation, I was concerned a little bit about the uh, disposition of evangelicals toward the Roman Catholic religion. Now, I was raised in the Roman Catholic religion and and, and went through catechism and confirmation and so forth. But uh, I, I left the Roman Catholic religion and was kind of free-floating and uh, ultimately came to Christ through reading the scriptures and, and having been witnessed to by some Christians uh, a little bit later on in life. And uh, after going to seminary and being a part of the pastoral ministry, I began to notice that there was a shift taking place in our nation that more and more evangelicals, more and more articles and books were written uh, favoring the Roman Catholic religion and sort of building this large tent and including not only Roman Catholicism but a number of other non-Christian religions under this tent. So I began looking around for books that may address this issue and there weren't too many books out there. And I came across one book in particular written in the early 50s by a man named Lorraine Bettner. And at that time, Dr. Bettner had written a standard work on the Roman Catholic religion, but it was outdated. And along about that same time, a Roman Catholic writer wrote a book, an apologetic book, wherein he set about to do what uh, the book says debunk Lorraine Bettner. In other words, to disprove all that Lorraine Bettner was saying about the Roman Catholic religion. You're so, talking about Carl Keating? Carl Keating, right. Mm -hmm. Carl Keating's book. So I read Keating's book uh, and, and read Bettner's book again, and I, I asked the question almost out loud, has anybody answered Keating? Now, he started Catholic Answers. He did. He started Catholic Answers in San Diego, and no one at that time had given a direct answer to Carl Keating. So I decided, well, Let's give it a try. And that's when I wrote my, uh, my very first book. And this book is entitled Romanism, The Relentless Roman Catholic Assault on the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it's a long title, Romanism, The Relentless Roman Catholic Assault on the Gospel of Jesus Christ. But it's a purposeful title. This book goes through every single chapter of Carl Keating's work and analyzes the Roman Catholic position on virtually every aspect of their religion. We have in this book a chapter on baptism, penance, purgatory, the Eucharist, the Mass, the place of Peter invoking the dead, Mary, justification, the so-called charge of professional anti-Catholics, and a final chapter on the changing face of Rome due to Vatican II. So this book was written in response to a very strong Roman Catholic writer. Mm -hmm. And that actually began the ball rolling to have a, a more full-orbed, ongoing ministry to the Roman Catholic mm -hmm. community. But, as you know, in 1994, a statement came out called ECT, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, where a number of prominent evangelicals actually signed a document essentially endorsing the Roman Catholic religion. This document came as quite a shock to the evangelical community. It still has a rippling effect to our day. 
And I think I, it was signed by like Bill Bright of Bill Campus Bright, Crusade, Campus Crusade uh, J.I. Packer, uh, J.I. Packer, uh, um, a number of people. And that led me to write my second book. My second book is entitled On the Edge of Apostasy, subtitled The Evangelical Romance with Rome. This book is extremely important because we analyze the modern evangelical thought patterns of those who would want to convince us that the Roman Catholic religion is just another branch or form of Christianity. And uh, did a lot of research, it's well footnoted, and uh, I, I just spent a lot of time trying to answer the question, why would evangelicals ever think that the Roman Catholic religion is in fact a Christian religion and should be considered as an alternative worshiping community to Christianity? And having written this book, I got into all kinds of trouble because uh, it flies in the face of the modern uh, thinking mm -hmm. of ecumenism. Mm -hmm. So this deals with the ecumenical movement and a number of broad organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have it available for you on a number of okay, various websites. Uh, could you briefly mention a few of your other references before we... Yes, we realize that a lot of people don't like to read long books, so we've written <laughs> short books. And this booklet right here is a, a book that we've sent all over the world. It's entitled Salvation by Grace Through Faith Alone or by Grace Through Sacraments. And this is a very uh, concise analysis of the Roman Catholic sacramental system. And it's not too hard to read, it's not too long, it's direct, and we think we hit the point very well. But for those who like to read booklets, <laughs> we have written a tiny little booklet that we do send out a lot. It's called, I'm a Christian, you are a Roman Catholic, so what is the big deal? And this also has been translated into Spanish as well. And uh, I like to remind you that uh, we do send these booklets over to Spanish speaking nations and people. In fact, we made, a, we made a Spanish video out yeah. of that, and it is yeah, on it is. YouTube. Yeah, it the, is on the audio YouTube. is on YouTube. Right. So between the, the larger works, the medium works, and the smaller works, this is a sampling of the kinds of things that we use uh, to help Roman Catholics understand their own religion and also to help evangelicals understand the Roman Catholic religion. And in doing so, I think you'll, you'll have to agree at the end of the day that the Roman Catholic religion is a religion unto itself, and uh, uses, in some cases, many Christian terms, but defines them with a completely non-Christian dictionary. That's the way well, I like to say it. I would like to mention also that uh, for those of you out there that uh, may not be familiar with our, uh, uh, our YouTube channel page, See Answers TV, you're seeing it right now on your screen. But uh, you may not have noticed that if you look at our channel page and you go down a little bit, on the page, you'll find that we list several websites, BibleQuery.org, MuslimHope.com, uh, HistoryCart.com, BereanBeacon.org, PilgrimPublications.com. And then there's one right under, after that called CWRC-RZ.org. Now, does that sound familiar to you, Rob? It certainly does. That's our website, uh, Larry, cwrc rz rz.org and if you come to our website and scroll through it there are tons of articles and information on how you can get these books and pamphlets and we'd uh, love to hear from you you can email me and uh, order anything you want off the website yeah, i'd also like to mention to our viewers that if you're on our channel page you'll notice we have 19 playlists that go down the right hand side of the page on all kinds of subjects third one down is on jehovah's witnesses and mormons and and uh, Seventh-day Adventists and so forth. But as you get way down in there, you, you find Roman Catholicism. As you're seeing on the screen, this is our playlist on Roman Catholicism. At the time we did this video, it was we had 79 videos. We've got more now But uh, by the time you're seeing this. But uh, as you're looking at this, uh, you see that we have uh, all these videos, and Rob is in quite a few of these videos. Mm. Rob, as the people are looking at this, they, they see here that uh, there's a Boston College debate. And what happened in that particular video, for instance? Well, the Boston College debate was a, a debate that uh, centered around the authority of the Pope at Rome. Essentially, it was our duty and, and privilege to debate two Roman Catholic scholars on stage at Boston College, and they presented the Roman Catholic uh, persuasion on the Pope at Rome, who's considered in their religion to be the vicar of Christ on earth, and 
we did everything we could to refute their understanding and also to present the, the biblical Christian understanding of the person of Peter. So that, that's the, the very kind of thing that we do, and we have it on videotape. And anybody who's interested in the difference between what a Roman Catholic scholar would present about their own religion and about the Pope at Rome, and the contrasting view, the antithetical view, actually the opposite view of biblical Christianity, that would be a good debate to watch. Right, and I wanted to mention on our playlist, we have our 16-hour video series with Rob and me that we did like 20 years ago. Right. Uh, but that covers uh, the, the whole orb of all the teachings and doctrines of the Roman Catholic religion. And then we've got all kinds of other videos that Rob and me have done as well. Your debate with the Monsignor, right. for instance, that was most interesting. He was basically saying you can believe anything yeah. and it doesn't really matter. I'm letting uh, everyone know that we have many, many videos. One last thing I want to say is if you type Rob Zins, that's R-O-B, Z-I-N-S, into the YouTube search box, you'll get a whole plethora of Rob Zinn videos that are available on YouTube. And if you were to type Rob Zinn's Romanism, once again, you'll get even more Rob Zinn's videos <laughs> in a plethora of uh, videos available. And as you can see these things, there's just some samples there on your screen. But uh, with that said, we just wanted to call your attention to all the resources that are available through this brother in Christ here, former Roman Catholic, who was saved by a supernatural act of God. That's really the difference in a real Christian who has been born again, John 3, 3 through 8, through a work of the, the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit over just getting baptized or, or doing all these sacraments or things of that nature. We're talking about what makes you a real Christian is a supernatural act of God on your behalf where before you were dead in your sins and trespasses. Yeah. Behold, now you're alive in Christ. And that's really what changed your life. Amen. All right, okay. brother, with that said, uh, we're going to go into, this is just a promo leading into a main video. So uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, little information uh, situation for discussing Rob. And I uh, hope you enjoy the video to come. God bless you all. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, the Director of Christian Answers, and I want to thank you for, our, for being with us on this Christian Answers Presents show. I'm joined in studio with my very special guest and good friend, Rob Zins. Well, it's great to have you here, brother. Thank you, Larry. Good to be here. <laughs> All right. And uh, we're currently in the middle of a, uh, a series we're doing on uh, uncomfortable questions uh, for Roman Catholics who love their man-made traditions and dogmas. Uh, so far, we've completed two shows, and now we're going to pick up where we left off from the last show uh, with the questions we were asking that were that can be considered uncomfortable for Roman Catholics. Uh, before I get into that, I'd just like to advertise the fact that people, if they'd like to see a lot more of what we do here, uh, go to YouTube, uh, put in the search box, See Answers TV. That stands for Christian Answers Television. That's our main YouTube channel. We have over 533 videos listed there on all kinds of subjects, including 19 playlists, uh, which will go into all kinds of subjects as you might be interested in from a biblical perspective. If you want to really see a lot of my guests here, Rob, go to the playlist we have on dealing with Roman Catholicism, idolatry, and the Virgin Mary. Click that on and you'll get to see a lot of Rob. <laughs> you more than you want to see. <laughs> Uh, last I saw, we had like 89 or 90 videos on there. And by the time all these videos end up on that playlist, mm. we'll be closing in on 100 videos just, mm. on, just on Roman Catholicism by itself. Mm. Uh, we have uh, like almost 70 videos on 
Church of Christ, Campbellism, you know, they believe in water baptism, they'll save you. And, mm -hmm. and then we've got like 65 videos we've produced on Islam and, mm -hmm. and the different Muslim sects and things like that. But then as you go through the different groups and things, you know, depending on how many of them there are, it goes lower and lower. But uh, there seems to be a lot of Roman Catholics in the world. Oh, there so, are. There so are. since there's so many Roman Catholics, we've uh, proportionally done videos to try to match that billion number or whatever it is. And we, we, we have more videos to do, I'm afraid. <laughs> we have more videos That's to do. That's right. Well, uh, I'm going to, uh, as people that have seen our previous shows know, that uh, we actually have two Robs here in studio instead of one. One Rob is the Roman Catholic Rob, who will be taking the Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic position on the questions I ask. And he will give the best answers he can from a Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic position. And then we have the born-again Christian Rob, who will then respond to what the Roman Catholic Rob had to say before him. And uh, it's worked out pretty good. It shows the distinctions between the two camps. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the whole reason we're doing this, so people can see clearly the difference between Roman Catholicism and biblical Christianity. That's the whole point of what we're trying to do here. So with that said, let me pick up where we left off from last time uh, with this next question. And uh, we're going to have Roman Catholic Rob answer this first and uh, see what he has to say to this question. Here it is, Rob. It says, what is venial sin? Is there such a thing as a venial sin that does not in some way break one of the Ten Commandments? If they don't break one of the Ten Commandments, then is that considered a venial sin? But if it does... Is that considered a mortal sin? Mm. Very good question. I'm glad that you've asked this question because I think in the Roman Catholic community that there's probably a lot of confusion about venial sins and mortal sins. And I think the best way to answer this question uh, in this video is, is, to, is to get to two parameters. The first would be, how do we identify a mortal sin and a venial sin. Secondly, would be what would be the consequences of committing a mortal sin and a venial sin? Right, if we can do that, then perhaps we can zero in on the idea of what actually constitutes a mortal sin and a venial sin. Now, I'm going to speak directly from the Catechism on this, lest I use words that are not part of the Roman Catholic Dictionary. We read in paragraph uh, 1859 of the New Catholic Catechism these important words. Mortal sin requires full knowledge and complete consent. It presupposes knowledge of the sinful character of the act. It also implies a consent sufficiently deliberate to be a personal choice. So in other words, to commit a mortal sin, one has to have full knowledge of it as a sin and complete consent to do it and also to understand that the character of the act is in opposition to God's law. Now, according to paragraph 1035, the teaching of the church affirms the existence of hell and its eternity. Immediately after death, the souls of those who die in a state of mortal sin descend into hell where they suffer the punishments of hell, eternal fire. The chief punishment of hell is eternal separation from God in whom alone man can possess the life and happiness for which he was created. For a sin to be mortal then in the Roman Catholic religion, three conditions must come together. Mortal sin is sin whose object is a grave matter, which is also committed with full knowledge and deliberate consent. Those three must come together. Grave knowledge, uh, a grave matter, full knowledge of it, and deliberate consent. And sins, according to paragraph 1854, are rightly evaluated according to their gravity. The distinction between mortal and venial sin 
became part of the tradition of the church, and it is corroborated, according to paragraph 1854, by human experience. In other words, some sins are greater than others. Some sins are less than others. So when we put it all together, we see that there are mortal sins, and if you die in a state of mortal sin, there is no recourse. You go to hell and you stay there. There's no way out. If you die with venial sins, well then, you're going to have to go to purgatory, and those venial sins are going to have to be expunged. They're going to have to be cleansed from you, and uh, there are many ways to have these venial sins cleansed from you. Your personal punishment in purgatory, the catharsis, the cleaning, or perhaps uh, your time in purgatory can be reduced by the prayers of the faithful on earth. But it's important for us to understand that venial sins only weaken the character. Mortal sins kill the character. They kill grace and the two are to be constantly kept separate. According to our catechism, paragraph 1862, one commits venial sin when, in a less serious matter, he does not observe the standard prescribed by the moral law or when he disobeys the moral law in a grave matter, but without full knowledge or without complete consent. In other words, he doesn't know how bad the sin is, he does it, it's venial. Or if he doesn't give his complete consent to it, he does it with a guilty conscience, knowing it's wrong, participates in it anyway against his better judgment, it remains a venial, a venial sin. Now I say all this so that we can get it clear in our minds that there are mortal sins and the repercussions are eternal, and they are negative, eternity in hell. And there are venial sins, the repercussions of which are not as severe, and which can be forgiven through such things as attendance of mass, going to confession, and even in purgatory, where venial sins are cleansed from those who land in purgatory with uh, venial sins. Now, the question that is perhaps more difficult to answer is what would constitute a moral, mortal, ethical, mortal sin? In other words, what sin could I do that I could absolutely be certain that it was a mortal sin as opposed to a venial sin? Well, the Catechism is not as carefully outlined in the numeration of sins as perhaps some of us would like it. But there are hints to it. In paragraph 1856, we read, when the will sets itself upon something that is of its nature incompatible with the charity that orients man towards his ultimate end, then the sin is mortal by its very object. Whether it contradicts the love of God, such as blasphemy, or perjury, or the love of neighbor, such as homicide or adultery. So at least these four, blasphemy, perjury, lying, or in the sense of how you treat your neighbor, such as homicide or adultery. Blasphemy, perjury toward God, homicide, or adultery. These would be considered mortal sins. We get another clue in 1447 of the same thing. The paragraph in the, in the Catholic Catechism that I'm referring to in 1447 uses idolatry, murder, or adultery as tied to the mortality of sin. I can't give you a refrigerator list of mortal sins. All I can do is ask you to be honest with yourself and put the criteria to the test. 
When you commit a sin, is it a grave matter? Is it committed with full knowledge? And is it deliberate consent of your will? If so, most likely it's a mortal sin. And the mortal sin will not be remitted. It will not be forgiven in mass. It must be confessed. Penance must be paid. And there can be no forgiveness without the sacrament of reconciliation. That's our position on these things. Now you had a follow-up question, I think, to that, didn't oh, you? Oh, basically it was, is there such a thing as a venial sin that does not in some way break one of the Ten Commandments? If not then is not the sin a mortal sin? Well, there are venial sins that do not break the Ten Commandments, obviously. You can commit a lot of venial sins that don't break the Ten Commandments. Uh, I can think of uh, a one perhaps that you might not be familiar with, but if, if, if you were to um, uh, participate in a day of holy obligation where you were bound by canon law to uh, perhaps light some votive candles or go through the stations of the cross, but you decided to go to a baseball game instead and, and you, didn't, you didn't observe that. Now, this is a violation of canon law, but it's, it's not what we would consider to be a mortal sin. It would be a venial sin in the sense that you haven't abrogated uh, the moral necessity stemming from the Ten Commandments in, in this type of sense. So, it may be argued, I suppose, that all of our sins are in one way or another selfish, or they are idolatry in the sense that we're serving ourselves and not God. So you could attach them, perhaps by way of extension, to the Ten Commandments. But we like to separate them out in the sense of a greater sin or a lesser sin. It just seems like common sense to us. Hey, I mean, if you go out and murder somebody, that's mortal. But if, if, if you uh, yell unnecessarily at your wife because she burnt the tote, and you hurt her feelings, that's venial. I mean, it's not the same as having an affair with your, uh, your, your, your uh, neighbor's wife. So a lot of this is common sense, and we as Roman Catholics understand the latitude that's there, but we want to have these kinds of things separated in our minds because it, there seems to be in Scripture a sense where some sins are going to receive more punishment than others. I mean, there's a sense where in, uh, in hell, the punishment may be more severe for some sins than others. If you, if you, if you get my understanding of uh, the parables of Jesus, he seems to indicate that kind of thing. So though I can't give you a refrigerator list, I can at least give you the parameters and an understanding of what it may mean. And I, I hope that that... Now let me ask Roman Catholic Rob, if, uh, let's say you're a Roman Catholic and you commit a mortal sin, but you're not really aware that it's a mortal sin, and you fail to confess that mortal sin to a priest in a confessional. Right. And so there's no penance done, and he just misses it. And the years go by, and eventually he dies. What's the situation in, in that case? Well, that's an easy one. Paragraph 1857, which I have already read. Now you must pay attention to me now. <laughs> I've already read this. Mortal sin is a sin whose object is a grave matter which is committed with full knowledge. Mm -hmm. So you can't commit a mortal sin unless you know it mm -hmm. is a mortal sin. Mm -hmm. So your illustration, it would be impossible. That sin would not be mortal because you really didn't know what you were doing. You didn't, you didn't know. Okay. You have to have full knowledge. And then full consent. But what if, what if the person thinks it's really something that needed to be done and he feels, he justifies his own sin in that, in that case? It's a moral sin, but he doesn't feel like it is. He's making a decision on his own between mortal and venial. Well, I would suggest to that person that he would go to a priest and uh, sit in council explain to the priest what he's done, perhaps in confession, and let the priest decide if it's mortal or if it's venial. 
I mean, sometimes people are just not able to examine themselves as carefully as we think they ought to. But if you have a priest who's an expert in this sort of thing and understands, certainly understands canon law, mm -hmm. understands uh, our, our faith better, uh, he'll be able to sort it all out. I just wanted to ask Roman yeah. Kelly, but Rob, one more thing here. I, I, there's a movie that's kind of famous throughout the years uh, called The Godfather. And you see these these mobsters murdering each other, and then they go to they go to mass. <laughs> kind of like after they gun down a bunch of people, they feel like they go to mass and it'll be all right. And in their minds, they're okay. They don't understand the full ramifications mm. of Roman Catholic theology of you, you've just explained. They don't understand that. That's true. And so they're thinking the Mass is going to get them off the hook. Right. So how would you respond to that? Well, the Mass will not get you off the hook. And uh, all Roman Catholics should know if they don't. If you commit a mortal sin, you don't go to Mass. You're disqualified from Mass until that mortal sin has been confessed, penance applied, and forgiveness granted through the Church. I... I what you see in the movies is uh, what you see in the movies. It doesn't correspond to reality. So you're saying those mobsters in the movie The Godfather, are they're wasting their time going to Mass after murdering a bunch of people. They're probably doubling the effect of their sins by committing another sin of participating in Mass, having mortal sin unconfessed. That's right. exactly right. Now, with that said, I'd like to hear from born-again Christian Rob in response to all that you've just heard. <laughs> well, I'd like to thank the Roman Catholic once again for stopping by and sharing with us <laughs> the Roman Catholic uh, categories of sin, but uh, I must say that there was a distinct lack of biblical evidence for all of this. I mean, we can say along with the Roman Catholic, and I think it comes from the overall sense of Old Testament history and even the uh, priorities set for by our Lord in the New Testament, that there are some sins that are greater than others. There are some sins more heinous than others, some sins more, uh, uh, shall, shall we say, uh, absolutely horrendous than others. And we recognize that as Christians. But here's the catch. The New Testament tells us that whether it be a greater sin or a lesser sin, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the uh, Roman Catholic religion likes to satisfy the venial sins by landing those participants in purgatory. And then they like to get them out of purgatory through the prayers and, and candles of the faithful at home. They also uh, put such a distinction on mortal sins that they run their mortal sin forgiveness through a new covenant priesthood, uh, ultimately leading to uh, personal appeasement, personal satisfaction, and atonement for sins. And this is where the Roman Catholic religion uh, uh, is heretical. It, it would be all right, perhaps, to try to break down things into greater or lesser sins, whatever definitions you want to give to them. But where the Roman Catholic religion comes up as heresy is that they have given their people a false hope. They have said that if you're a venial sin person and, when you, and you die in it, you go to purgatory. Purgatory is fictitious. It doesn't exist. There's no place known in Scripture as purgatory. What the Bible does say, what the New Testament says, is that one sin committed under any circumstances for anything at any time, when that is a sin, that sin and that sin alone is sufficient to send you to hell for eternity. That's the book of James. It is not a matter of mortal. It's not a matter of venial. It's not a matter of running through a New Testament priesthood that doesn't exist in the New Testament. It's not a matter of running into the Mass and getting forgiveness of venial sins. It's not a matter of landing in purgatory. All that stuff is fictitious. What you need to understand is that in, in, in building the categories of mortal and venial sins, you have built a superstructure around this category, 
giving people a false hope. Christians will say to you right now that any sin you commit one time qualifies you for an eternal hell before a righteous God. And the essence of the gospel is that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is no second chance. There is no backup. There is no second plan of purgatory. When you die, you're going straight to hell unless that sin is forgiven. And that sin cannot be forgiven by a new covenant priesthood. It cannot be forgiven by penance. cannot be forgiven by confession. cannot be forgiven by the fictitious Roman Catholic Mass. It can only be forgiven by Jesus Christ. And the only way that can be forgiven by Jesus Christ is to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, confess your sins, repent your sins, and take the righteousness of Christ for your own. You need His righteous covering. We talk to people all the time about sin. We examine our own heart about sin. And uh, I remember talking with a person who felt he was a pretty good person and at the end of the day he wasn't going to be charged so much for his sins because of all the good life he had lived. And I said, how many sins did you commit today? And he said, I don't know. I said, well, let's just have some fun here. Let's take a guess. You got how many hours of daylight and, and nighttime are you up? Would you say you're up 12 hours? He'd say, man, maybe more. Maybe I'm up, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm up 16 hours. Okay, you got 16 hours in a day, right? I said, would it be fair to say you just sinned three times in one day? Or is that too many sins for you? He says, what do you mean by sin? I said, thought, word, and deed. And not only what you do, but what you fail to do. That's a sin too. He said, well, I'd probably go more than three. I said, well, let's stick it three. Okay, so you got three a day, seven days a week. Seven times three is 21, right? That's one week. What's four times 21? I think we're close to 90, probably 84. Okay, 84. 84 a month, okay? In 10 months, how many have you committed? Well, 12 months, that'd be close to uh, over 1,000 sins in one year. Wow, how old are you? You're 55? So say you've been committing sins since the age of reason, that's seven. So you've been committing sins now for 48 years at a clip of about 10,000 a year. How many sins is that? If you say it's a half a million, will that take you to hell? That's just three a day. And I'm giving you a break on that. You don't have a hope. Don't you realize that you don't have a hope? And the hocus pocus of the Roman Catholic religion dividing these things into moral and venial and taking all of this data and throwing it in your face and making you feel guilty for doing this, doing that, and everything. You don't have hope. There's no forgiveness in the Roman Catholic religion. None. Zero. And you are standing before me with a half a million sins to your account. And you're a good guy. What about the bad guy? You see, it's folly for mankind to think that his righteousness can be gained through the mystical voodoo rituals of a man-made religion, even though they become masters at wordsmithing and twisting and even inventing categories of sin, as though a venial sin weren't so bad. A little white lie sends you to hell, my friend, just as much as if you walk across the street and bludgeon somebody to death with a hammer because your heart is wicked and deceitful and you're guilty. Guilty in sin, guilty of sin, and you are a black soul. You need Christ. That's why we tell people, flee to Christ, flee to His righteousness, and you can only gain it in abject poverty, crying out to a Savior for a righteousness that you don't have. And Larry, that's what I would say to the Roman Catholics who want to break this down into their foolish categories. Very, very well said. All right, with that, let's go back to the Roman Catholic, Rob, and have him answer this next question. Is the Mass an unbloody sacrifice? If so, then what is the wine changed into in the consecration? If not blood, then what? If blood, then it is a bloody sacrifice, is it not? So let's go back uh, and, uh, and, and uh, answer you with one of the most profound mysteries in all of history. And I want to answer you from the, the uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church. I'm going to quote paragraph 1367, 
which I personally take on board, and I believe it with all my heart, as a Roman Catholic. The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. The victim is one and the same. The same now offers through the ministry of priests who then offered himself on the cross. Only the manner of offering is different. And since in this divine sacrifice, which is celebrated in the Mass, the same Christ who offered himself once in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and is offered in an unbloody manner. This sacrifice is truly propitiatory. So in answer to your question, we say that Jesus Christ at the cross shed his real blood on the cross, flowing down red, absolutely visible to the eye of the beholder. That's one blood, okay? But in the Mass, in the sacrifice of the Mass and in transubstantiation, there is no literal blood. There is the blood of Christ present, but it's in a different form. It's in a different manner. The offering is the same. The propitiatory nature of the offering is the same. The satisfaction of God is the same. When this is completed and an angel wings his way to heaven and presents this sacrifice in the Holy of Holies, it's the same effect as Calvary because it is Calvary. They're one in the same. We don't re-crucify Jesus Christ. We perpetually represent Jesus Christ in the Holy of Holies. Therefore, I have to say to you that at the cross, though it's the same sacrifice, the manner is different. At the altar, in the Eucharist, it's the same sacrifice, only the manner is different. The blood is effective, but in the one case, it's physical. As in the ripped flesh of Jesus Christ, it's physical. But in our case, the blood is not physical, although it's real and it's present. And the flesh is not physical, although it too is real and it's present. You see, this is a profound mystery, how we can view a piece of bread in its accidents, the outside nature of it, as being physical, but its essence, its being, is the actual body of Jesus. It's the same with the wine. On the outside, it looks like wine to us, but on the inside, it is the actual blood of Jesus. So in one sense, we sacrifice the blood and body of Jesus Christ, presented to God. It's unbloody. But in another sense, since it is the perpetuation of the exact same sacrifice of Calvary, it is truly his blood of Calvary. And that's the way it's explained. And I know that you're going to say, boy, that sounds like a lot of gobbledygook to me. It sounds like you're going back and forth between these different concepts. And I can only say to you, uh, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. And sometimes mysteries are just very difficult to explain using human terminology. But we do our best because the scripture yields this kind of understanding. Just like Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How can he be the Son of God and yet God? How can he be fully God, fully man? These mysteries before our very eyes, they can't be explained. That's what a mystery is. It's something that is real, but it yet remains unrevealed to us. At some point, perhaps in heaven, we'll have a better understanding of these things. But for now, you have to realize it's one and the same sacrifice, one bloody, the other one unbloody, insofar as appearances is concerned, but both the exact same sacrifice. And that's the best that we can do. Now, I can understand your kind of... Uh having a little difficulty explaining this. I'm talking to the Roman Catholic Rob here mm. uh, because, you know, my laws, I mean, my understanding of the laws of, 
uh, logic and non-contradiction. It almost sounds like you're saying it's bloody and it's non-bloody at the same time. It's like you're arguing both sides of the fence simultaneously and just saying this is a mystery. Is that, uh, is that a, a fair conclusion on, based on what you just said? I would say yes. I would say that to comprehend the mysteries of the Incarnation or to comprehend the mysteries of the Mass, to comprehend the mysteries of transubstantiation, you do have to suspend your limited concept of knowledge. We all do at all times. You know, a lot of times children play this game, how many numbers are there? So we give them a number, right? And then they say, what's the next number? Well, we say, well, there can't be a next number. And then they laugh and they say, sure, take everything you just said and add one. <laughs> so it's all that plus one. And now, see, we're talking infinity. Mm -hmm. Who can understand infinity? Well, I can't. And I think sometimes that our logic fails us. And when it fails us, we're left with this high mystery. And that's the way it has to be explained. It has to be explained as a high mystery because both things are true yet they're true in different forms, and yet the forms are almost beyond our comprehension. And we as Roman Catholics are, are absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ revealed himself and then presented himself in these mysterious forms and fashions, and that's the way I would explain it to you. All right, for now I would like to go to the born-again Christian Rob. And Rob, as you just heard from Roman Catholic Rob, uh, he's actually admitting that uh, he's violating the laws of, con uh, of contradiction, the laws of logic, going beyond logic, to try to establish this Roman Catholic point. So I would now like you to just deal with everything he said. Well, in the first place, we as Christians do not believe in transubstantiation. All right, we've already gone over this. And because of that, it's really a mute point to argue whether or not that it's a bloody or an unbloody sacrifice at the altar of the Roman Catholic uh, Eucharistic celebration. Uh, they say that it's uh, unbloody, but it's the real blood of Christ being offered. Uh, they say it's the same as Calvary perpetuated, only there's, there's uh, sight blood and sight flesh at Calvary, uh, and uh, uh, they see with the eyes of faith the blood and the flesh on their altar. Well, uh, of course, all this is fanciful and all this is Roman Catholic speculation and all this is Roman Catholic invention. There is nothing in Scripture that would uh, engage this kind of reasoning as being responsible exegesis. There's, there are just no passages of Scripture, there are no verses, there are no paragraphs, but let's get down to the heart of this matter. Here's the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is that Roman Catholics believe that this is a propitiatory sacrifice and that Jesus is perpetually sacrificed over and over and over again and that this sacrifice is carried by the wings of angels into the Holy of Holies presented before God and that God is constantly being satisfied with a ongoing perpetual sacrifice. Well, of course, this flies in the face of Scripture. If there is no Scripture for all of this other stuff leading up to the propitiatory sacrifice, let's take a look at scripture that absolutely denies it. The Roman Catholic priest is bound by the same limitations of the Levitical priesthood. The Levitical priesthood ended because of death. They could not continue because of death. Therefore, there had to be hundreds of them. Same with the Roman Catholic priesthood. They died. Roman Catholic priests die, so there has to be a hundred more to take their place. This is where they have everything in common with the Levitical priesthood. The Roman Catholic priest offers this supposed bloody, non-bloody sacrifice that is not his own, just like the Levitical priest did. He offers blood which is not his own. Roman Catholic priest offers a sacrifice for his sins, just like the Levitical priest offered a sacrifice for his sins as well, for his sins and the people. You see the parallels? The Roman Catholic religion is a perpetuation not of Calvary, but of the Levitical priesthood. 
It's a perpetuation of those old Levitical ministers who served at an earthly altar made with hands. And they produced this alleged sacrifice over and over and over and over again. And when we come to the New Testament, we find an entirely different story. In contrast, Jesus Christ offered his own blood, not the blood of others. Jesus did not offer his blood for his own sins because he didn't have any sins. His blood is the only offering in the universe that counts. Jesus did not offer himself often, but one time. Jesus offered himself in the heavenly tabernacle not made with hands on this earth. Jesus is the only one who can serve at that altar. A Roman Catholic priest cannot serve at that altar. Only Christ. Only the perfect one. Now this is where it gets down to the, the differences between the Roman Catholic religion and true biblical Christianity. Christians are committed to Hebrews 7, 13, for the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar, and that is Jesus Christ, not from the Levitical priesthood, but from the tribe of Judah after the order of Melchizedek. The, the seventh, eighth, and ninth chapters of the book of Hebrews utterly dismantles, destroys, and makes obsolete the entire Levitical priesthood. And the Roman Catholic religion reinstitutes it with their version of a new covenant priesthood. That's why it's blasphemy, that's why it's heretical, and that's why it's not only unbiblical, it's antichrist and it's anti-biblical. Listen to Hebrews chapter 9. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. The Roman Catholic altar is made with hands, which are, true, which are figures of the true. But Christ in the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then he must often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once... In the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many unto them that look for him, shall he appear a second time without sin unto salvation. In reality, the claim that the Roman Catholic priest offer a sacrifice that removes venial sins is utterly contrary to New Testament revelation. Jesus Christ's blood covers all sins, not just venial sins. Here is, in our estimation as Christians, the hidden ugliness of the Roman Catholic Mass. It only forgives venial sins, and yet it is said to be the perpetual representation of the blood of Calvary. You've got an army of Roman Catholic priests teaching you that their unbloody sacrifice, which you must attend, and all this pomp, and all this circumstance, and all this transubstantiation, and all this melodrama is designed, and it's said to be the blood of Jesus Christ, but yet it only forgives venial sins. What a blasphemy! What a tragedy! If anything, this Mass should forgive every single mortal sin that has ever been committed, because it's the actual blood of Jesus Christ. Do you not see, you're saying this is the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and it's being sacrificed totally and utterly by a New Testament priest, that it appeases God, satisfies his wrath, and it's propitiatory, but it only satisfies when you make a mistake and burn the toast for your wife. You commit a mortal sin, it's not covered. As a matter of fact, so corrupt is the Roman Catholic Mass that when you commit a mortal sin, you can't even go to it. You can't go to the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't go to that bloody, unbloody altar. You can't be satisfied with that blood. God can't be a pleased, not for you. You've got to go to a priest. They place the priest ahead of Jesus Christ, even in their own Mass, and that's why Christians say it's blasphemous, it is absolutely contrary to Christianity, and it's absolutely heresy. And the Roman Catholic religion is not Christianity for this reason alone. I hope that answers your question. <laughs>
<laughs> I would say it did. Very well said, brother. Okay, now for the next question. We go back to our Roman Catholic friend. I hope he's recovered from that uh, uh, little I, I, tongue. I, I'm sorry for my uh, outburst there, but... <laughs> Goodness me, when you put it all together, do you realize if we just take a second here what they're saying? Of course, you made it perfectly plain. They're saying... You're making it perfectly plain. The centerpiece of the Roman Catholic religion is the propitiatory sacrifice of the Mass. Right. They say it's the blood of Calvary, mm -hmm. but it only forgives venial sins. Right, which violates the Scripture. The Scripture makes it clear the blood of Christ forgives, forgives us of all sins... And, and so they if, deny that. If it, if, if, it only, if, if it only forgives venial sins, the mortal sins have to go to the priest. Right. And Therefore, so he the controls priest, the soul, on it, whether he goes to heaven or hell, based on the, the duties he gives the guy. So which is more important, the priest or the blood of Christ? Right. And that just shows you the heresy, like you pointed out so clearly, yeah. of the Roman Catholic religion. How there's no way this, this caricature, this, this, this counterfeit, could be true Christianity yeah. in any biblical sense of the word at all. And I guess that's why we're here. Okay, that's exactly why we're here. <laughs> Most people don't see this at all. I but I think we're making it perfectly clear. Uh, okay, we've, we've got about 15 minutes left in the show, and I'm going to try to ask our Roman Catholic friend and our born-again Christian friend to see if we can get a couple more questions in before we run out of that 15 minutes. All right, uh, let's so give it a try. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what I'll we try can do. to be fast. <laughs> I just hope the Ro our Roman Catholic Rob can uh, kind of survive that last uh, lip, lip uh, lashing he took from uh, Born Again Christian Rob. I'm getting beat up <laughs> over here. <laughs> so, so anyway, here's the next question. Explain why eating meat on Friday was a mortal sin punishable by hell prior to 1965 and now it is no sin at all how can a mortal sin be dismissed or changed into a non-sin well for, for you to understand this you're going to have to understand a couple of things about our religion our faith as a roman catholic in the first place we don't decide as individuals what is sin and what is not sin we leave that to the godly ordained hierarchy that he has so graciously set over us. He's given us the Pope, he's given us uh, the Cardinals, he's given us the bishops. And when all three of those meet together in a council, they make determinations of this nature. They, after studying the scriptures, the church fathers, the history of the church, they make determinations. Now, prior to 1966, it was determined by uh, a number of popes, a number of councils, and put into canon law that because Jesus Christ was sacrificed on that bloody altar at Calvary on a Friday, that Friday should be special days. And one of the ways that you can make it special is that you can identify with the sufferings of Jesus Christ in a small way. So it became necessary in order to have our, our, our people, Roman Catholic people, identify to a greater extent with the death and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to simply participate in a small way in sacrificing something of our own. And the sacrifice that was deemed most appropriate by council and canon law was that Roman Catholics worldwide should abstain from eating meat on Fridays. They should avoid the eating of flesh on Fridays. This was made mandatory in the sense that the uh, weakness of the human heart, the human spirit, uh, is always susceptible to temptations and if left on their own, these temptations would overcome. So in the spirit of unity, the spirit of cooperation, and the spirit of identification, and knowing what's best for Roman Catholic people, not only to identify with Jesus Christ in this way, but to separate themselves out from the world, to take them and say, you know what, we're different. We are different. We are Christians, we're Roman Catholics, we're different. And so when Fridays rolled around, we, we, we were told, and rightly so, I think, 
that it was a holy day of obligation and the obligation was to abstain from eating meat. Now, once that is settled and it's set and it's promulgated and it's filtered through the normal channels of Roman hierarchy, we are obligated to obey this, to knowingly defy this, to give consent of the will and have full knowledge of it and so forth. It's a mortal sin. You don't disobey this. This is a matter of obedience. This is a matter of faithfulness to the vicar of Christ on earth. This is a matter of faithfulness to the apostles of Jesus Christ, whom we have today in apostolic succession. This is a matter of following Jesus Christ. And of course, there were those who thumbed their nose at this, who made excuses, who uh, secretly violated this and were caught and so forth, and they had to have this uh, mortal sin removed in confession. And it was, and, and if not, and they died in this, well, then they're in hell. They're in hell because they committed a mortal sin in the time that they were asked to be obedient to a direct command from the vicar of Christ on earth. All right? So now you say, well, how can all this change? Well, it can change the same way that it was brought about. Meeting in conference, meeting in ecumenical council, meeting uh, the Pope, the cardinals, the bishops together, made a determination that there were parts of the world where meat in the diet was absolutely essential for survival, and that in other places there was so much meat and, and, and so much uh, food and plentiful diet so forth that the, 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 uh, the impact of sacrificing something lost its impact. You give up meat, you've got 60 other varieties. So the bishops, using the wisdom of the age in the sense of observing all that was taking place in the world with, with full counsel with the Pope, decided to make a change. It's not that we have given up on Fridays. Here is the change. It is no longer commanded that you abstain from eating meat on Fridays. It is commanded, however, that you do some kind of personal penance, some type of reparation. It might be going to a mass, it might be in your private time, devotions, praying, and things like that, but something to commemorate a Friday. All Roman Catholics are still bound by this, but the severity of the failure to conform was reduced from mortal to venial in the sense that uh, even though it is a command, it was left to the bishops of each nation to determine how best to implement it to a particular nation. So for instance, American Roman Catholics have a whole different venue than say European Catholics would. And uh, in the wisdom of God, in the wisdom of the church, it has come down to we as Americans have a different agenda, a different satisfaction, a different set of rules, as you might say, to follow, but it's all good. What you need to understand is that when, when it is a rule and it's from the Vicar of Christ, we're bound to follow it. And we're bound to follow the latest. As a matter of fact, I brought with me, I thought you might ask this kind of question, <laughs> the, uh, the church's teaching since uh, 1966. On November 18, 1966, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops met, and here's what they decided. Friday itself remains a special day of penitential observance throughout the year, a time when those who seek perfection will be mindful of their personal sins, the sins of mankind, which they are called upon to help expiate in union with Christ crucified. Friday should be in each week something of what Lent is in the entire year. Friday is a day of self-denial, mortification, and prayerful remembrance. Um, and, and they go on. Our deliberate personal abstinence from meat, more especially because no longer required by law, will be an outward sign of inward spiritual values. In other words, we recommend it, but if you don't do it, it's not going to be a sin, providing you do these other things that follow. So, Times change, the church expands its understanding, God gives more revelation, and these, these acts of penitence, these acts of vitality, these acts of grace are different in each generation.
Okay, so basically what you're telling me is that you can, based on the, the uh, hierarchy of the church, the popes, the, 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 the bishops, the cardinals, you can change something that's a mortal sin into something that's a no sin at all. And uh, could I just interject this quick question? Uh, it, this doesn't seem to be based on any scripture I know of. There's there any specific Bible verse that says you're not to eat meat on Fridays? There is not. But remember, we are, as Catholics, not limited to the Bible alone for our sources of faith, morals, and practices. We have, for our recourse to ethical and moral events, the history of the church, sacred tradition, and as I mentioned, when the church meets in a full ecumenical council, the decisions of the council are final insofar as our practice is concerned. So we don't necessarily have to have a book and a chapter and a verse for this, although there are occasions of fasting. I believe the Apostle Paul fasted for an event that he was about to participate in. I, I believe members of the church from time to time did fast and prayed together, and, and Jesus did say of the demons some of these would only come out by. So fasting is not bad. We've just taken it to its logical extension in the wisdom of Mother Church and define these particular practices. All right, with that said, I'd like to have uh, born-again Christian Rob step up to the plate and take a swing at this uh, reply that I just got from Roman Catholic Rob. Well, I would like to say as a Christian that this all falls under the category of one word, and that word is arbitrary. As long as you are in subjection to a dictatorial, hierarchical religion that has at its top a person or a, a, uh, an office that is given so much power and authority as the Pope at Rome has been given, and then a conclave of cardinals and a, a variety of bishops meeting together, you are going to be subject to what they think is the right thing to do, and you are going to be submissive to their laws. And it's very true that you can go outside of the Bible and find these things and, and find them in church history, find them by way of example. You won't find them by way of command, but you will find them by way of example here and there. And you're not limited to the scriptures. So Roman Catholics, you think that because you're not limited to the scriptures, this is an advantage. We as Christians think it is a great disadvantage because when you go outside of scripture, then it becomes the whim of the dictator, the whim of the leader. Now, I granted you have implicit trust and faith in your leadership, and they would never lead you astray. But history tells us another story. History tells us there have been times when there have been three popes, not one. History tells us of the decadence of the popes. It tells us of the disorder of the Roman Catholic religion. It tells us of the mockery of Jesus Christ that they make and all their ordinances and rules and all of their doctrines and dogmas, some of which we've touched upon. So I would say that this is a classic example of arbitrary oligarchy dictatorship, wherein a few make decisions for all. And you know what? Tomorrow they could change this rule again. They could come together and say, we've been mistaken all these years now. We've been mistaken. We're going to a different direction. We're going to ban meat not only from Thursday, but from Monday as well put you under the ban, make it a mortal sin, and there you go. This sounds to me like the Muslim religion much more than Christianity. You're much closer to the Muslim who arbitrarily have to hear the voices of their, their ayatollahs and their, their priestly leaders, and it's not, it's not so nice as the Roman Catholic religion, just a mortal sin that awaits uh, confession at a later date or ultimately uh, hell. How about getting your head cut off if you don't obey? It doesn't come to violence in Rome, but it comes to an awful end if you die in these mortal sins that are made up by these man-made laws. Now these man-made laws are talked about in the New Testament as traditions of men. Jesus Christ hated them because these traditions of men superseded and eclipsed the very word of God. And we as Christians say the same thing. I mean, in 1965, you go to hell if you have an unconfessed mortal sin and it's a mortal sin to eat meat on Friday and you don't confess it, you get a, you get a knot 
and you decide you're going to defy the Roman Catholic religion, you're going to hell. Six weeks later, the bishops say it's not a mortal sin anymore. We're going to have you do it on your own if you don't, and say a few prayers. The guy and a guy goes to hell. The other guy doesn't. You say this is fair, this is realistic, this is the way it ought to be, but the only way you can say that is because you believe that your leaders, your, your oligarchy dictatorship has the right to control what you think and how you believe and what is a matter of faith. They don't believe that you can do it on your own. They don't believe that you can read the Bible and come to an understanding of what Christ demands of us. They don't believe that the Holy Spirit is the vicar of Christ on earth as we Christians do. And therein lies the distinction, once again, between the Roman Catholic earthly religion, a religion of priests, just like the Levitical Code, and biblical Christianity. We who are free in Christ, and who have conviction of Holy Spirit, and who are guided and directed by His Word and His Word only. That's what I would say to that. Very well said. Well, we're all about, about a minute to go uh, before we have to sign off. I uh, did want to say, just in listening to you there on that response, it reminded me so much of, you know, I do a lot of counter-cult Christian evangelism, dealing with Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, and all these, you know, Muslims yeah. and things Drink like that. Drink the Kool-Aid. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, they're, they're so similar to what you're talking about here with Roman Catholicism. Right. they got shifting doctrines. You look into Roman, I mean, the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormonism, they, they do almost exactly the same kind of stuff. They have this doctrine one year, they change it to something else. Right. They're going back and forth. Right. Uh, and you just see this pattern yeah. throughout all these cultic and false religions. Uh, people that don't study this stuff, they don't see it, they don't know about it, they probably don't care about it. But the thing is, when you're into the middle of all this, you start to see that re reoccurring pattern right. all the time. Well, Rob, we're out of time for this, this show and this series. Uh, great it job. It goes by that. fast, doesn't oh, it, brother? It does. It's outstanding uh, information. Good. Both of you did a good job. Thanks. Although I like the second Rob better than the first. I thought you might <laughs> like So anyway, I want to invite everybody that's watching this to uh, tune into our YouTube channel. Our main YouTube channel, C Answers TV which stands for Christian Answers TV. And we got all our, we got hundreds of videos posted there on all kinds of subjects, 19 playlists. Our websites are there also uh, for you to access uh, BibleQuery.org where you can also get all our newsletters online besides all the other great information there. And uh, also at the beginning of the show, you saw Rob Zins' uh, contact information in his email his uh, websites and so forth. So, all right. Well, with that said, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, study the show thyself, approve the workman, and need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And with that, I'll sign off for now. Join us again next time. God bless. Amen. Amen. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian debater. My daughter Marlena has come out with a Christian music CD entitled, Win This Fight. It has eight songs that she has written and performed herself. Some of the song titles are, Win This Fight, Love Song to My Lord, Vessel to You, Waiting to Hear From You, Jesus Is, and Others. YouTube viewers can listen and see Marlena's music video, Jesus Is, 
right now free. Just type Marlena Wessels, M-A-R-L-E-N-A-W-E-S-S-E-L-S, in the YouTube search box and click on her video on the page that comes next. If you would like more information about getting a copy of her CD, just email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's C-D-E-B-A-T-E-R at aol.com. Or give us a call at 512-218-8022. Thank you, and may the Lord bless you and yours. To the Jesus